Welcome to this RTPI uh, webinar on running an effective planning service during COVID-19. Um, uh, my name is uh, Philip Chapel Selenko. I'm, I'm the chair of uh, the RTPI Yorkshire. Um, just before we start, I want to say a few things about the housekeeping rules. So it's not so much about the fire service or stuff like that, but it's about um, the fact that, uh, as you've probably noticed, you're muted. Um, but however, you can use uh, the uh, the box on the right side where it says questions um, to write uh, questions in there and ask questions um, there, uh, once Derek um, has finished. Um, also, um, I want you just to make you aware that this uh, webinar is recorded today. Um, so in terms of today's programs, um, we're looking very much forward to hear from Derek uh, McKenzie about uh, running an effective planning service during COVID-19. Um, this will, uh, Derek will um, uh, give us his talk uh, as a first part of this today's webinar until around um, 11.30. And after that, for the second part, um, we, will, we will have a question and answer session um, with another around 30 minutes or so. So this really should give us plenty of time uh, and you should have uh, lots of opportunities to ask questions. Uh, now, um, uh, just briefly, let me introduce uh, Derek. He is the vice chair of the RTPI Yorkshire and he is chief planning officer at Sefton Metropolitan Borough Council. Um, uh, Derek has a long uh, career in planning in both in public and in the private sector. And um, as I said, he will uh, today give us a, a talk about running an effective planning service uh, during COVID-19. And uh, it's a pleasure for me, it's a pleasure for us uh, that we're having him. And um, yeah, Derek, uh, if I can do so, um, I'd like to pass on to you. And um, we are looking forward uh, to your presentation. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Philip. Good morning, everyone. Uh, just by way of providing some additional background on myself in terms of my planning, uh, I was an assistant director of planning and transport uh, with the council up until about 2007. I left there for a really exciting opportunity in Dubai, where I eventually took on the head of planning approval role with one of the largest mass developers in the world called Nakheel. Uh, since uh, returning to the UK in 2011, I've mostly been operating uh, as a planning consultant, uh, specialising in public sector interim management and focusing on specific uh, roles such as transformation, setting up teams, forming shared services, outsourcing, uh, or even looking at bringing outsourced services back in-house. I've also assisted a few councils in helping them to speed up their local plans. I've done two interim roles uh, at Sefton, and I took on the role permanently in December 2019. So I'm very grateful to be able to talk about some of the work initiatives that's been happening at Sefton. And it's been happening largely since we received the Chief Planning Officer's letter in March this year. Although, and I'm sure I speak for many councils at the moment, things appear to have got a lot more complicated with the plan changes to the planning system. And at this moment in time, I'm still trying to understand the likely implications and what they're going to be for us. And I'm sure you're all in the same boat. But notwithstanding this, Second Council is fully committed to doing everything it can to assist in economic recovery. And it recognises that planning has a pivotal role to play in this. So for us, as a department, it's a really solid platform. Now, I do anticipate several questions around what we're up to, and I look forward to the Q&A session at the end. So, uh, the story so far during COVID-19. Well, there's nothing unique about the fact that the whole service is working from home, or that applications have been affected. This will be the same in most places, I imagine. But at Sefton, we've experienced an 18% decline in applications in the four-month period March to June although applications in June were up on last year, and same again for July, which is positive news. But I think a lot of the councils are experiencing something very similar. Now, despite the drop in numbers, which is not insignificant, performance hasn't uh, changed. And you might ask, why? 
Now, although performance is good at 97% on majors and others, you may have expected a marginal increase with the extra capacity that this might have created. But it's important to stress that seldom do we get to operate in ideal climate. Uh, and compared to this time last year, we had four vacant posts that, that we can't fill due to recruitment restrictions. Also, during this time, offices have been instructed to clear applications that are going nowhere. And that's encouraged them to be withdrawn or actually going through the formal disposal process so we can actually you know, get rid of that worry and try and create more capacity. There's also been an uptake on pre-apps, and I'll talk more about pre-apps in due course. When you take all this into consideration, there is a reasonable basis to assume that performance would likely have increased as a result of fewer applications. What I can say is that staff and customer surveys tell us that all is well, and I'll talk more about our COVID-19 staff survey later. Uh, but there is a view that it's been business as usual right from the very start of lockdown with lots of positive energy around wanting to do more. And that's actually re reflected across the whole of our organization. I do plan to talk about the range of measures in operation at Sefton, which are aimed at assisting economic recovery. And although we feel they're quite ambitious, it's important to stress that how we've managed to achieve and sustain them is just as important as the measures themselves. And this is all the more important with the radical changes that are coming our way in terms of changes to the planning system. So on that basis, uh, I'm happy to share what, what we're doing, but I have to say, it comes with a warning in that as something of a transformation specialist, I don't believe there is a one size fits all approach. I know some councils are already doing some great work out there, but I know from my own experience as a consultant and from being a member of the RTPI's Independent Consultants Network Steering Group, and that's a legacy before I turned back to local government and one that will be ending soon, that it's not a level playing field out there. Some councils are really struggling, and this could be to many reasons, and I feel that they're too complex to go in at this moment in time. So I want to talk to you now a little bit about our foundations for success. Uh, it's important to uh, set out our foundations for this. And if anything resonates with you in terms of what we're doing, then it could be right for you. Business resilience. Business continuity is central to service delivery. About two years ago, we started to prepare for service-wide flexible working. With the last tranche of IT rolled out in January this year, that involved large laptops, making sure we had access to back office systems, payments, and mobile phones. Now, we didn't do this in anticipation of a global pandemic, uh, but or, or for the, the same matter, we didn't expect the whole service to switch to working from home almost overnight and for so long. But I have to say, the timing was fortunate and enabled us to complete that process so that we could have this business continuity. And this is really important uh, in that we've provided support structures for flexible remote working, such as training, guidance, on, and, and this, is, this is essential, guidance on making sure that we maintained quality control as part of this new working arrangement. Uh, the structure that we put in place has made it really easy to uh, update our responses to particular challenges, such as uh, carrying out site visits, erecting site notices, doing general consultation, etc. I'll touch on core values because I personally believe that it's important to possess a set of values that define what a modern fit for purpose planning service should look like. Now, I accept that there are different approaches to this, but for me, the core value concept has uh, been really helpful in changing service culture. And I've used it very successfully in a number of interim roles. Just switching to the core values, we have five. Uh, we use these to shape our service at Sefton. They're self-explanatory, so I don't need to go into them in any, any detail here. But it's really important to stress that we don't just pay lip service to this. They are embedded in our everyday approach to business. We provide training across each area. They form part of our performance appraisals. They provide a basis for actions associated with ongoing service review. We have a specialist group set up to, to do that, which helps keep us focused. And it also appears as a strap line on our service emails, which goes out to, to everybody we communicate with. 
fundamentally, we have buy into this from our stakeholders, and they're pretty good at reminding us if they think we're straying from the path. So, just in terms of uh, our culture, I think it's really important to stress how important the customers are to this, this side of our business. We genuinely put them at the heart of everything we do. We seek their opinion and we try to allow them to shape service. In terms of creativity and innovation, this is really important in modern planning. Uh, we encourage our staff to be creative and innovative, and we celebrate and reward that success. Now, in my view, it not only helps to foster a can-do attitude towards work, it also motivates and empowers staff. And our staff feel valued, and this is what they tell us. And I believe that builds on the above by helping to maintain really positive attitudes in, the, in their approach to work. And because of this, the service really does accept change and adapts very quickly to it. This is vital in an ever-changing environment, and in particular, during the period where we've had some real challenges with COVID-19. This last point is about uh, the staff understanding what the service is all about. And it is one of the most important areas in service delivery. My staff really do understand the role of the service can play and facilitating positive change. It's particularly in improving the quality of people's lives and they recognize the contribution we can help in the fight against COVID-19 in economic recovery of the borough. Now, I, when it comes to culture, I can't resist telling the story about NASA, not long after they had a man on the moon and they did this documentary and they interviewed everybody uh, in the team, including somebody who was sweeping the corridors. And they asked him what his job was, as, as if it wasn't obvious. And his response was, well, I'm part of the team that put a man on the moon. Now, that is what you call substantial acceptance of what the culture of an organization can, can achieve. And it raises the expectations of everybody. I'm not saying we do anything as exciting as putting somebody on the moon. But I like to think we're not too bad at helping people put food on the table through facilitating growth which to many would probably be more important, but the same principles apply. If any of my team are asked the same question, I'm confident they would say something positive about being part of one team that can make a difference. And when you get to that stage in, in your, your organization, you really have built in a vast amount of extra capacity that can achieve so much. So I'd like to talk a little bit now about uh, the other strand of the, of the service, which is about communication and close working. As I said earlier, we've got a really good relationship with our agents. Like many services, you know, we use them to assess the quality of service that they receive. We carry out surveys and, and you know, we really do respond to, to positive and negative feedback. Gives them a chance to shape the service the way they want it, and they've been really vocal in telling us what they want in COVID-19 lockdown. And one of those recurring areas is, is quicker decision-making and discharge of conditions. So we've tried hard to do that. In terms of consultees, this is an interesting one because as we've discovered, you're only as good as your weakest link and others outside your service might not be signed up to the program. Uh, so under our core value of collaborative working, We've already set up service level agreements and we're exploring ways of offering more incentivization through our use of the PPA process to help us meet some of those goals. And the early indications are that uh, they too have got their resource issues and constraints, but anything that we can do to help raise capacity is greatly appreciated. So it's a positive dialogue and we're trying to get everybody to move in the right direction as, as sustainably as we can. Corporate stakeholders, I mean, I think we all accept that we don't work in a silo in this modern era, but we are fortunate that we're actually seen corporately as, part, as a service that really is part of the solution. Although I should stress that it hasn't always been like that and we've had to you know, repair some, some damage from approaches historically, but we're there now and uh, it, it really is, uh, makes us sort of really good working relationships. But at the same time, we have to be accountable for the work we're doing uh, 
uh, particularly around finances. And there are financial implications in terms of uh, some of our measures, which I, I will touch on. But let me assure you, trust and close working goes a long way in terms of opening doors to allow you to be creative and try and push the boundaries out in terms of planning and service delivery. In terms of politicians, well, we're no different to any of the council when it comes to politics. But like all stakeholders, we work with them to help perform their roles to the best of their ability. And with councillors, it's more in relation to their community leadership roles. And this in turn helps us. So we responded quickly to the, uh, the business and planning bill and the sort of initial changes prior to this, and more lately, the general provincial development order. And those changes do need explaining, including our approach to this. What we've found is our politicians, ward members, they can handle many contexts that would have otherwise found a way to us. And that in turn creates more capacity for us, but it empowers them in the roles that they perform. As long as they've got a little know-how, they can do a lot. And it's a great business model that's working well for us. Lastly, in terms of staff, this really is the essential component. Without the commitment and cooperation of my staff, wouldn't be able to do any of this. And I'm going to talk more about this shortly as part of the COVID-19 staff survey. Okay, so we get to the bit you've all been waiting patiently for. Uh, but as previously stated, if you're thinking of doing something similar, it is important to know how we've been able to get to this point. And for those of you that are wondering, we did take council advice uh, before going uh, forward. Uh, in terms of the stakeholder meetings for major investors, I think a lot of councils uh, do this anyway, and they recognise the opportunity and the importance of these, these high-level meetings. So I'll talk straight about our uh, free pre-application advice service, if, if, if I may. It's, it's being trialled uh, for six months. Now, the estimated loss in that six months is going to be about £40,000. Uh, having said that, we're already up by 10% on pre-apps, over and above what we would have got this time last year. And that's worth about £8,000. And these schemes could generate potentially £100,000 in application fees if they come forward. In July, the number of apps was up by, pre-apps I should say, was up by 15% with a value of £13,000. And that could yield a combined fee of about £190,000. So for us, it's, it's working. It's generating more interest and potentially lining up a few more applications that will certainly go a long way. But isn't it strange at a time of financial uncertainty? In fact, it almost feels counterintuitive to sacrifice a revenue stream when you need to make savings. But if you put the economic recovery measures to one side, it actually makes business sense that supports the old adage, you need to speculate to accumulate. So it is potentially a way of creating savings further down the line. And we're actually starting to, to feel the benefit of that, although at early stages. Renewal of consent. Uh, well, this has now been relaxed by the Business and Planning Bill, which gives automatic extensions of time to all schemes expiring between March and December this year. Uh, it will potentially save us a lot of money, but even before this was, you know, these changes were introduced by the bill, what we were doing was seen as a very positive gesture and a genuine attempt that would accelerate development. So it was well received. And uh, I, I, the government's changes, uh, it was also well received by me in terms of uh, saving us a bit of money for paying out. Uh, we come to speedy decision making now because I think this is, this is critical to what we do as a service. It's key to our agents and investors and we aim to determine all our planning applications in time where we can, and that is without seeking extensions in time. Now, I'm not saying we're never going to use extensions of time, but we're only going to use them for their intended purpose where this is absolutely necessary. I think some service areas have a different approach to this, and uh, sometimes you can hold things up. We're genuinely going on the attack now to make sure that we can get decisions shipped out as quickly as possible. And by the same token, determining discharge of application, conditions applications within 21 days 
is also seen as a critical part of this. I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, our flexible approach to temporary schemes and the pragmatic approach to enforcement, particularly for those involved in enforcement who might be listening in. We think it's right to do this where we feel it's going to help in the fight against COVID-19 and or assist in economic recovery. Uh, a couple of examples where there was a supermarket that should be closing at 10 o'clock at night and it was in effect operating 24-7 uh, and they were doing this to make time slots available for key workers and allow continuous delivery so that food supplies you know, were maintained. We, we have to return a blind eye to that. Uh, we're now in a situation we want to try and control it again, uh, having felt we've got through the sort of the worst of lockdown. But that's an example of taking a, a, you know, a flexible or a pragmatic approach to enforcement. We have a large hotel in the Greenbelt that can't obligate its wedding commitments because of social distancing. So we're thinking allowing them to put a huge marquee up in the green belt for maybe six months so that they can get on with it. And that's an, another example of, of putting this into to good practice. But you'll notice that these two items on the presentation in front of you are marked with an asterisk. Uh, and this is because it's an area of one of the biggest challenges that we've got because communities are not always sympathetic to the greater good. And having said that, we don't just accept anything. There's still a planning, a planning balance to be achieved. And sometimes it's not always practical to support schemes. And that, that's the fact of it. And again, the politics comes into it and we have to take a hard line. But generally, there, there is more, more relaxation in, in our approach. Uh, so we look for compromise and we encourage developers and applicants to work with communities before the planning stage. That's really important for us. So I think it's fair to say the bill has provided some clarity, but it's important to stress that we're not necessarily restricted to this and we can find other ways to be creative. I'd like to talk a little bit about local development orders uh, because these can make a difference by uh, streamlining the planning process. We're currently working with our regeneration team to identify areas where we could use these and whether they have the greatest impact in stimulating growth. It's an ongoing piece of work that brings the planning policy team into this process. Virtual planning committees. Well, yeah, we were given a very clear steer from the highest level in our organization that whatever approach we adopted during COVID-19, it needed to be inclusive, transparent and accountable. So for these reasons, the use of the chief executive's emergency delegated powers in lieu of planning committee were firmly rejected. It did take us a little while to, to get our virtual planning committees up and running, but uh, we learned from others who embarked early on this process, and I take my hat off to them for being among the first to do it. But we were keen to avoid making similar mistakes, and it was deemed important by our chair of planning committee uh, to have something that was fit for purpose and fundamentally reliable. So the committee now meets every three weeks, uses Teams Live, and the feedback has been really positive. But like anything that relies on good Wi-Fi connections, sometimes you can be hostage to fortune. Not a lot you can do about that. So I'll talk a little bit about the staff survey. And this is a document that is available for you to download as part of this webinar. So you probably had a chance to have a look through it. Uh, I'm not going to cover everything uh, and I'll touch on some areas. But for me, it was critical to understand how the whole service working from home for so long was impacting on service delivery. I also wanted to know how it was affecting staff and to use it as an opportunity to identify potential implication for the way we work post COVID-19. And we have had some interesting results. So staff generally happy working from home, 85%. Uh, I'm in the 15% that, that isn't, but anybody who's a chief, head of service, listening in, you'll know exactly where I'm coming from when I, when I say that. Uh, interestingly, there was a, 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 a general view that the performance productivity had improved or had been largely unaffected. And that's actually turned out to be fairly, fairly accurate. There's a recognition that some office functions still require you know, the, the service to be open. And, and that in particular related to going in to print site notices and uh, conduct consultation exercises, et cetera. So we had a very skeleton crew going in to do this on, on a rotor, but providing a really vital role to what we do. Uh, 
interestingly, we staff are communicating with each other and feel supported. 100% felt supported. That's because we have a whole industry of WhatsApp subgroups going on, a real hive of activity, people communicating, talking, getting help, getting advice, just keeping the spirits high. And when people don't engage in that, we actually find out why and bring them into the fold. So it's really important that you stay communicating with everybody so that everybody feels part of what's happening. So I'm not surprised we've got such a high response rate on that. Uh, a desire to come back on the office, to office on a shared home basis, 97%. I mean, that has got to have implications because when we know that performance isn't really affected and the staff are happy, we have to look at this in terms of how we go forward. And if that has changes in terms of our office requirements, then so be it. Uh, so there are high level discussions going on now about, about what we do with this. Technology has been okay, but there's room for improvement. The biggest issue has really been about the speed and reliability sometimes of accessing systems, which has been counterproductive to a certain extent in terms of the, the, the benefits of that extra capacity. But significantly, working from home has improved things like work-life balance, finances, and health. And that includes mental health for a lot of people. Uh, so all of this is really, really good stuff that makes to sort of make, ensure you've got a happy, vibrant, reliable workforce. And then, interestingly, in terms of the way we engage with our agents and applicants, some of the staff have found it much easier doing it electronically rather than setting up real meetings and it's uh, less time spent on travel restricting the time within the meetings so it's all gone really well so conclusions as i take us up to the sort of half hour mark uh, okay so we know that customers are satisfied with what we're doing and we've got the evidence to prove that uh, the flexible working culture seems to be well embedded and it's continuing to function effectively for the time being and i say for the time being because as we know there are significant changes coming and we can't really at this early stage assess what the implications are going to be but one thing is for sure with the culture of the service being the way it is we are going to be geared up for making those changes really quickly uh, Again, staff and politicians understand the important role we have to play, especially in economic recovery. And fundamentally, they really are up for the challenge because creativity and innovation hasn't stopped, even in lockdown. Uh, and they recognise now that this is the time to be creative and take risks. And we've got an organisation that allows us to take those risks, which is, which is wonderful. Uh, the economic recovery measures we're doing up to date, very well received although it is still early days and we won't be getting the bunting out just yet to celebrate, but we're keeping an eye on those things, particularly the financial implications and the timeframes. These need to be closely monitored and we're continuing to do that now. Uh, and again, we recognize that delivering these measures is gonna have some change, require some change, but we don't think it's gonna have a harmful impact in the service thus far. And this is really, really important there is a stakeholder-wide belief that what we are doing can genuinely make a difference. So to my mind, this makes it all worthwhile. Now, we're being constantly advised that we're, we're about to enter into one of the greatest recessions we're ever likely to face in our lifetime. As a profession, and particularly in our regulatory roles, I think we need to show how we can help weather that storm, because if we don't, it will eventually catch up with us all. So thank you very much for listening to that presentation. Over to you, Philip. Thank you very much, Derek. That was a, a really very, very good insight in what's going on at uh, Sefton Metropolitan Borough Council and also in, in, in the wider context of uh, COVID-19. If I may, so I would start off with uh, one or two questions. And please, as I said before, uh, please feel free um, to um, ask you questions just uh, look on the right side where it says questions and type in uh, whatever questions uh, might relate to um, uh, uh, Derek's talk um, if I may start off uh, Derek with uh, the first question which uh, came to my mind about uh, virtual planning committees uh, you've briefly touched uh, in your presentation on that 
um, you said um, they would be held every three weeks and uh, the, the feedback would be quite positive. Um, if I may ask, um, uh, some uh, local planning authorities um, haven't basically haven't put in place any virtual planning committees so far. Um, do you think do you think if things are going more uh, more and more back to normal, so to speak, do you think that uh, they want um, that they won't be held any longer, or do you think that uh, local authorities would still um, um, do virtual planning committees in the future? Thanks, Philip. Uh, I think there's a couple of questions there. Uh, first is uh, virtual planning committees versus perhaps, say, chief exec delegated powers and then the future role of virtual committees. But I, I think both approaches can work if they operate properly. Virtual committees, they get better every time as all those involved get more experience. But regardless of the forum you use as an alternative, say, normal planning committee meetings, you need transparency and accountability with, and that includes things like publishing agendas and reports and minutes now although virtual committees are not perfect they are at least you know meeting those tests uh, so even if you use the structures enabled by your chief executive delegated powers you should follow the same approach in my view i'm aware that's not always the case and when that happens it can actually damage your reputation as a service so for this reason i would say it would be unwise to continue with that, that approach if you're not being transparent and switch mm -hmm. to virtual committees. But as I say, do it right, and both systems can work. Uh, as for the future role of virtual media, uh, you know, post COVID-19, I actually don't see them disappearing. I think it's probably fair to say that the majority of councils would prefer to hold real meetings, and that's certainly the case at Sefton. But I think now that uh, we've shown that we can do this, I actually think they offer another tool to assist in decision making. So a good example of this might be where there's a really contentious or controversial proposal that uh, requires a significant number of people to attend the meeting. Now with post COVID-19, social distancing is still going to come into play. And I think it's going to be a challenge to find venues to hold these big meetings. So with virtual planning committee option, this, this could offer a solution. So I don't think they'll be as prevalent, but I don't think they'll disappear. I think they really will become an extra tool to assist in decision making. I think that's positive. Mm -hmm. May I briefly ask you uh, another question about the uh, Business and Planning Act 2020, uh, 2020. Um, do you think um, that what's in there basically uh, about the economic recovery, like um, extension of planning permissions and so on. Do you think that these uh, that, that these um, uh, are sufficient or that uh, other things other things are required by the government or that the central government could do more about that? Uh, thanks for that. It's two really easy questions you've given me there. Thank you for that. I, uh, that's a good question and I, and I think it's probably one that's on, on the mind of a lot of people. I think the government has responded quickly to the COVID-19 crisis. And if we focus on the, this issue, rather than uh, its need to change the whole planning system in general, then I'd say that the bill is going to make a difference in terms of economic recovery, uh, extended construction hours and you know, outside paving areas for cafes and restaurants already having an impact and uh, you know, it, it's working. Notwithstanding that, I think there is scope for improvement and uh, this sentiment carries forward to the whole package of change to the planning system. What I mean by this is that, as previously stated, I don't believe there is a one-size-fits-all approach to planning. Each area is different, it has its own sets of problems and each organisation is different. And so I don't understand why everything has to be treated the same. Now I accept that some councils haven't performed well and uh, They've got a real capacity issue and this is an area the government wants to try and tackle to avoid holding up development but what about those councils that have consistently performed well in terms of the speed and quality decisions issued also in my view i think what's more important is what your customers think of you how they value you i mean if they think you're doing a great job change needs to be carefully introduced in my view 
So I think customer satisfaction service is an area that the government should tune into, perhaps with a standard template, and perhaps use these to afford greater freedoms and flexibilities to those councils that are telling them, you know, that, that are providing them a good service, where the customers are saying, you're doing a great job, and then allow them to speed up decision-making by tackling local issues. So, and I hope that is something that, that, that really is taken on board at some point going forward when all this unfolds in terms of guidance and procedure, et cetera. I can't, don't think I can offer much more on that, Philip. Yeah. Um, we've got, we've received now a, a few questions. Um, um, so I'm, I'm really happy to go on uh, with those questions. And please, as I said, don't hesitate uh, to write down any questions, any thoughts you had about uh, Derek's talk. Um, just starting off uh, with the first questions uh, which came in. Um, it's about uh, work from home. Uh, basically, um, Tim Moss is asking, um, have you, Derek, have you came across uh, a work from home survey that compares the experience of staff by house type neighborhood? It's basically, which goes into more detail of that. Uh, thanks, Philip. Uh, in answer to Tim's question, not, not really. Uh, I'm, and I'm just trying to sort of understand the, the advantages of, of doing that, if I've understood the question cor correctly. Uh, is, is, this, is this to try and understand uh, you know, something that's relevant to the, the planning system in terms of uh, whether or not you need consent to do it, or this, is this about staff and the different uh, impacts that it could have on them in different environments? I'm not sure if we could expand on that. I'd be you know, really gladly to try and help Tim. Mm. Okay, um, maybe maybe Tim could uh, uh, ask a, a follow-up questions on that or give us a bit more background to that questions. Mm -hmm. I would then go on to the next one from uh, Michael Fisher. Uh, he's asking, he's a recent graduate, and he's asking, is there a great deal of anxiety around companies being able to take on graduates? Do you think, uh, Derek, that COVID-19 will hinder future opportunities for graduates? Uh, again, a really good question. Uh, it, it's interesting, isn't it? Because uh, a lot of this will depend on what investors and developers feel about the service that you're providing. We work with a couple of national uh, uh, developers. I, I won't mention their names, uh, but one in particular has said, uh, in terms of our approach to to business and being open for business, being proactive that they really are advising and encouraging their clients to invest in Sefton. Uh, and off the back of that, they're actually finding a lot of work. Now, I think business is picking up in general in terms of the development industry. And I think graduates will continue to have a role because they do provide a really important role in terms of the, the skills market and uh, having an opportunity to grow into becoming properly qualified planners. But uh, as far as I'm aware, the feedback I've received is that uh, companies, particularly in the private sector, are more inclined to grow and invest with those councils that are, that are proactive and can demonstrate their ability to be open to business, make decisions quickly. And we're not the only council that does that. So I imagine that there will be a lot of growth opportunities out there. In the public sector, you know, we still have to uh, meet supply uh, in terms of the workload. And we are building cases ourselves to fill some of the vacant posts that we need uh, to get on and do the job. And some of those, you know, uh, uh, can be tailored directly at graduates. So, I, I, I you know, I, I would say that the future is reasonably hopeful uh, in, in that market. I hope that helps, Michael. Um, I've got a, another question, which is um, related to the previous one from Helen Ferrer. Uh, she's asking, um, have you or have Sefton Metropolitan Borough Council taken on a new staff during lockdown? And have you effectively effectively supported this staff? Um, this has been a key difficulty in getting set up, ensuring they have support. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a, re a great question. Uh, we haven't been planning, but we have been building control. And one of the issues that we've had is precisely as Helen's highlighted, the difficulty of doing proper inductions and the difficulty of sort of them shadowing more senior officers, et cetera. 
they've done the best they can through the, the virtual route, but it's not the perfect solution. And there will need to be some catching up. So yes, we have employed people and we have struggled in terms of the normal uh, HR inductions and, and uh, training that, that we need to do. But we've done as best we can under the current virtual uh, uh, climate. Uh, and but we recognise that when we get th if things get back, <laughs> uh, we we uh, may need to do some catch up on that. Uh, we are also trying to uh, get some planners in, uh, and I think the difference will be to a certain degree the the, the sort of experience they have in joining the organisation, because we want to get people to touch the ground running and not necessarily focus too much on the professional side uh, and and deal with the HR issues a, a, as swiftly as possible. Um, thanks for that, Eric. Um, I've got a few other questions for you. Um, in terms of um, the impacts, uh, Philip uh, Jill had a, a, questions, a question about that. What impacts have you found on the planning policy service as a result of COVID-19 and how have they contributed to the Council's response? Yeah, okay. So that, that uh, is quite relevant really in terms of what, what we've been doing. Uh, the, so the planning policy uh, team has not been as active as perhaps they could be. That's not because of the, uh, the work, but that's because uh, there's pressures in, in other areas. And so already we've redeployed a couple of staff from the policy team to help out in the development management function, uh, particularly in relation to the increased pre-apps we're, we're receiving. Uh, we also have the, the, the team leader of that, of that service on top of the implications that we have in terms of service delivery through introduction of, of, of uh, national policy, et cetera. And we recognize though that uh, the policy section itself has to be active in this and so that they're involved in uh, local development orders and supporting other aspects of the council service delivery. And we're fortunate that we have a relatively recent local plan and we are keeping up to speed with things like the annual monitoring and the uh, housing data that we've got to provide. Uh, but we're trying to make sure that we've got enough capacity to, to undertake a very significant piece of work which comes out because if the government is going to introduce things like zoning and sort of permission in principle and the various spectrums of that, it does raise a question about the relevance of your of your local plans in this process, and uh, you know we, we we need to understand how we can adapt it, and that could involve a review. So we 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 have to keep a, an eye on on that as well, uh, and can't spread ourselves too thinly. But the policy team have been great during this process and been flexible in terms of taking on different roles. And in in fact, uh, we have had staff in other uh, other areas as well the technical support side that have gone in and helped and manned phones in terms of some of the finance and grant things that have been going on and they've done a great job had great feedback for that so it, it does happen thank you thank you derek um, um listeners and the attendees have asked question, a few questions about enforcement so um James Fox has asked, uh, how have planning enforcement offices adapted to site inspections, particularly where access internally is necessary to gather appropriate evidence, e.g. Uh, HMOs? Are these investigations on hold until government guidance changes, uh, or has there been an increase in the use of PCNs, etc.? We, uh, that's a, that's a, that is a, a really good question because when we were in the sort of the, the real thick of, of, of lockdown, uh, nobody was going into the premises uh, under any conditions. And we were working with landowners and agents to, to give us information. And we were using Google Earth to try and sort of get as much data as we could. Uh, and we were using telephones, contact numbers, writing to people. And we were getting as, as much as we could out of it. We didn't go as far as actually allowing people to go into buildings. Uh, and we took the view that it was more important to protect staff uh, than uh, go into the sort of depths of, of enforcement investigations. And uh, PCNs have been used for, 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 for sure, uh, but the staff have adopted re adapted really well to this. And uh, in, in my view, although the number of 
enforcement complaints that have increased, they've dealt with them as best they can by whatever means uh, and still keeping themselves safe in terms of entering properties. So they have found ways of doing this and uh, it's interesting that the number of enforcement cases uh, ha have, have increased by about sort of 15 percent and I think that's a lot to do with the fact of people just being at home and just bored and thinking they'll just put a building up, uh, stick a tree house up or, or you know do something and we, we've had to go and, and deal with that but the team have been great in terms of the way they've hand, handled this and at no time have they put themselves or anybody else at risk as a result of having to go and investigate and I think that the general views being that we just wait and give people a little bit more time than what we normally would have until things become safe till we go on site. But that's that's a, a really good question, James. Mm -hmm. uh, may I ask another question about enforcement? Um, Terry uh, Stolkova asked, uh, what other methods has planning enforcement used to maintain the service effectiveness during the pandemic? Uh, well, I, they, they've generally, uh, you know, done certain a level of site inspections uh, and sort of taking views from, from a safe distance and trying to avoid contact with other people as opposed to going directly on site. Uh, there was talk about investing in a drone, and I, but I wasn't convinced at this point, point in time it was right for us. Uh, but I, I think that they've generally been okay about the way you've gone about things. I think there's one thing to say about the enforcement service at, at Sefton, and that is about 75 to 80% of the cases they deal with are dealt with without the need for taking any action. And that's a testament really to, to the, the skills and the, the negotiation and the pragmatic approach that they, they take. But in specific answer to Jane's question, we haven't done anything uh, out of the ordinary in terms of carrying on that, that uh, investigation work as part of complaints. Thanks for that, Eric. Um... If you have got any other questions, please don't hesitate to, to ask them. Just write in um, on, on the questions um, tool to your right side. Um, I've got a, here another questions, um, question about uh, planning committees from Claire uh, Proctor. She was asking, most planning committees run through nine to five work hours. This may uh, limit uptake in attendance from the general outside community as they would be unable to travel to physical venues. So I'm curious to learn if going online has increased uptake and if this has improved the diversity in the types of question and answer comments received. If yes, could you provide some example? Yeah, uh, that's another, another really good uh, question. Uh, well, our, our um, uh, normal planning committee used to meet at uh, six o'clock in the evening uh, and sort of go on till sometime late in the night. One of the things that we changed when we went to uh, virtual planning committee meetings was that we brought the meeting forward to start at one o'clock in the afternoon. Now, we did get some feedback from some people to say that they were at work and that that wasn't sort of convenient for them. But in the main, I think more people have been happier to start the planning committee meeting virtually earlier in the afternoon. And I think that is all about accessibility and not having to travel. Uh, and certainly from the results that we get from our democratic services team, that there are more people obviously tuning in to planning committees than there would be attending. Uh, so I, it's very early to say whether or not starting at one o'clock by virtue of virtual meetings uh, is more effective than starting at six o'clock uh, with real meetings. But the early indications are that the flexibility of virtual meetings is certainly appealing to more people in terms of participation. And uh, I, I'd like to think if we go back to uh, real meetings, that, that maybe we could start earlier. That's nothing to do with my personal preferences. Well, of course it is, uh, uh, but uh, it would be good to uh, say, you know, start a little bit earlier. It's it's something that you have to monitor uh, and and you know be really careful about. And politicians themselves have got strong views about you know what they like. Uh, 
So we'll just watch this space, but I can say that the virtual meetings are certainly proven popular in terms of more people attending by virtue of starting a little bit earlier. Thanks, Claire. Thank you, Derek. Um, we've still got a little bit time, so if you've got uh, any more questions, uh, please don't hesitate to ask them. Um, I've got here another question from um, Harrison Landers. Um, asking about how have local authorities been affected by the change in the five years land housing supply following the period of under delivery well it, that, it's that's another really good good question and it's an, an area I, unfortunately i can't give a, a a detailed answer and it's one where we're, we're hoping to get some sort of further clarity from the government in recognition of the fact that clearly house builders have been delayed and not been able to get on with with development uh, and my my view is certainly from speaking at this at a sort of a regional level is that we're expecting some some further clarification about how we deal with these deficits in terms of five year land supply and what it means in terms of the relevance and up to dateness of policies. So it really is a case of just sort of waiting to hear what the government have to say about it. Okay, um, I've got another question uh, by Madi Shakibamanesh, um, who's asking or who's saying, thank you so much for this nice presentation. It was really my honor to join. And I uh, would have a question about, I uh, just wanted to ask this paradoxical question. Uh, how could we planning an anti-pandemic space or spaces and simultaneously don't weak the sense of motion which appear by huge people population which affect neighborhood densities so yeah. that's that's a, a a difficult question isn't it but a good question uh in terms of going forward i i, I think avoiding the uh situations where we could sort of worsen infection and the spread of viruses and and avoid the creation of pandemics I think it will work its way into planning policy at some point, particularly in public realm uh, uh, situations. Uh, we hope that we're never always going to be sort of contained into this, but I think going forward, we need to learn some lessons from what's happened in the past. There are lots of things that come into play when it, uh, it comes to sort of managing pandemics and, and the use of space, et cetera. Uh, and it, it's sometimes more about the management aspects of, of those spaces than the provision of those spaces but I, I wouldn't be surprised if at some point uh, we will get some sort of clarity in terms of how we deal with things like densities as a result of specifically of the COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot Derek. Have you got any more questions? Um, we we'll still have a few minutes left if you if, if anything else would come to your mind. Just uh, please don't hesitate to ask them. I'd, I'd, I'm sorry, Philip. Uh, if I if I could just sort of put a question out there, if anybody has any views on this, but I mean, what's people's thoughts in terms of uh, going back to work and the office requirements and the flexible working arrangements? I mean, is this a realistic proposition for a lot of councils in terms of investment in the technology uh, or is it an opportunity to make savings on accommodation and come up with completely new different ways of working? I'd be very interested to hear what people have to say on that. Also, Derek, what, what came to my mind is because you were um, talking about uh, and presenting the main results of your staff survey i was wondering did you um find that people people would would appreciate to have a kind of a mix of uh working patterns where they work a few days from at home but also a few days uh, from the office do you think is that something they want to see yes philip i mean that was a clear message that came out of our survey uh, that the majority of people, if they came back, they would like to do it on a sort of 50-50 basis, whether that's three days, one week, two days, the next. 
and then just split up the, the numbers so that uh, we, we keep the right number of uh, spaces in the office in terms of social distancing. Uh, yeah. And I think, uh, I think it's important to say that a lot of people, although they've enjoyed working from home and clearly benefited from it, they've missed out on, on things like work banter, camaraderie, you know, the chit chat and social interaction that goes on, but also mm -hmm. in terms of professional learning and shadowing. And, you know, we've had a really good question earlier about the issue of uh, new staff joining the organization and not being able to go through proper induction and, and, and uh, training with re relevant sort of peers within the organization. So all of that has to happen. And I think they want that to happen, but they recognize now that they are invested in, in a much better work-life balance by working equally from home as they do in the office. And you know, I, I, I would have no hesitation in endorsing that subject to service delivery requirements. And uh, the evidence suggests now there's no impact on that. So, you know, all for it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think uh, that's what, what uh, John Scott is confirming as well, because he is saying happy to work uh, more flexibly, but mustn't underestimate the value of face-to-face -face contact, bouncing ideas off each other, building team spirit. Uh, and Helen Branson was responding as well to your question, Derek. She was saying in response to Derek's questions, more staff working from home will definitely help uh, local planning authorities reduce their carbon footprints, which can only be a good thing. And she was also saying Zoom is a great tool for staff training. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we're still on a voyage of discovery, but Helen's absolutely right. Uh, you know, staff are happy working from home. It gives them so many options. And, and a lot of them, particularly when the schools were closed, it was, it was a lifeline to, to, to some of them. And, you know, we're grateful to have that flexibility built in. They can work their own hours and, and, and get on with it. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, and we are learning more and more different ways of using virtual meetings and systems to try and get training up and running. It does work. And it's just a case of making sure everybody's familiar with the technology and what your organization allows. But at the end of the day, there's more and more stuff coming on the market. And, I, and I'm pretty confident that we can address most issues in terms of some of the negative aspects that some people might perceive from working from home. So, yeah, I totally agree. Mm -hmm. Okay, is anyone having uh, any last questions for Derek? Um, in the meantime, because I've got uh, one question left, if so, if anyone has any other questions, then please don't hesitate to write it in. I've got uh, one question from John Ribbon, who is asking, um, how are committee site visits being held? Are public speaking being allowed at meetings online? Uh, another really good question, John, and the, the, the business model that we're doing is we're holding virtual uh, committee site visits. And uh, it's basically, as met, and, and one of the interesting things about it is a lot more people are coming on the virtual site committee because it's uh, far less you know, demanding in terms of time. And it's a case of literally using a variety of tools to just make sure that the members understand the nature of the proposal, <clears throat> They are very careful not to uh, show their hand and they ask questions about clarification. And generally, they're proved to be really worthwhile uh, as, as a way of uh, making sure that they, they come to the meetings well, well prepared. And, and I, I like that aspect of it. Our particular approach to planning committee uh, virtual meetings is that we don't facilitate direct access to the meeting by anybody other than the officers and members taking part. But to compensate for that, we give uh, anybody that has the right to speak the opportunity to make a written submission, which is then read out by an officer uh, as part of that process. And the offer is generally sort of well taken up and uh, it, it's kind of well received. My own thoughts on that is that the less complicated you make a process, the better it is. And so, as I say, when you're sort of depending on the Wi-Fi and the connectivity, the, the least complicated it is, then the less that can go wrong and the, the quicker you can get through business. On the downside, perhaps there's, uh, uh, you, know, you, you can't ask further questions of a speaker, which sometimes can happen. But overall, I'm 
reasonably quite pleased with the way we've gone about things and the way things are turning out for us with the virtual meetings. Mm. Okay, um, I'm conscious of the time. It's now 12 o'clock. Um, we have got uh, three questions left, which uh, we would tend, or four, which we would tend to uh, give you a quick uh, written response, if that's all right for you. I just uh, want to say uh, thank you very much, Derek, uh, for your talk, but also for responding and answering all the questions. That was really helpful, I think. Um, Thank you very much for, for attending uh, this web webinar today. I just wanted to mention before uh, we're logging off, which the end is quite abrupt, so don't be surprised. I uh, just wanted to announce uh, further webinars which are coming on. Um, these are RTBI Yorkshire webinars. Uh, the one is on Kellam Island, a sustainable neighborhood vision from Sheffield that will be on the 12th of October. Um, with uh, our RTPI president, Sue Mounts. And we've got another one uh, three days later on the 15th of October. Uh, that's uh, about planning a planning system fit for the 21st century uh, with our chief executive, uh, Victoria Hill. Uh, so um, um, just uh, don't hesitate and, um, and, and uh, join us with uh, those meetings as well. So again, thank you very much for attending uh, this webinar. Uh, it was really good to all having you and th thank you very much for your questions. Thank you.